Good evening, church. Um, this evening, I want us to, uh, before we even get started, I want to give in a couple of prayer requests. I know that we normally do that uh, on Monday night, and I want you to, we can look back even if you need to, and remember those requests from Monday night as well. But uh, tonight, uh, we want to be praying for Brother Arnold Amoson. Uh, I used to be associate and youth pastor under him uh, several years back. And uh, Brother Amoson is a good friend of mine. He's having some uh, really serious health problems. He is in critical care at Forest General Hospital in Hattiesburg with a coronavirus and pneumonia. Uh, and, and so we want God to touch him. If things don't get better with him, they're going to have to put him on a ventilator. So I know that God is able, and I want you to bind with us and believe for him tonight that God's going to touch him in his body. Uh, also, we want to pray for Robert Evans. That's uh, another friend of ours, uh, Sandra Oliver from the Tupelo area. That's her dad. He's in the ER at Tupelo with chest pains. And uh, we also want to continue to lift up and pray for Brother Gary tonight. Uh, I know that God can touch him and meet the need that he has. And um, we, uh, we want to pray for Sister Sue Teasley. I just uh, by text spoke to her a few minutes ago. Her mother has got a, re a really serious heart blockage, and they're going to have to do a procedure uh, on her tomorrow morning. So we want God to be with her and give her a healing touch in her body and also to guide the hands of those physicians as they work on her tomorrow. And God's not limited uh, by time and space. We can pray for all of these individuals uh, in Laurel, Hattiesburg, different areas, and God's able to be there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere all of the time. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer and ask him not only to bless these needs, but to bless us tonight as we go into our lesson. Tonight we're going to be talking about instructions for Christian living. But if you would, let's all just bow our head, go to the Lord in prayer before we get started for these needs. Lord, we thank you, God, for all of your blessings. These requests tonight, God, we pray that you would be with each and every one of them, Lord. Be with Brother Amos and be with Sister Sue Teasley, Mr. Gary. Uh, you know, ever need, God before we even bring it to you, but we bring it before you anyway. We know that you, your word says, God, by your stripes that we are healed. That provision has already been made, and we know that you are more than able, God, to, to accomplish what needs to be done in their lives tonight. Lord, touch our hearts and our minds tonight that uh, we would be open and receptive to your word, and we would hear what the Spirit is trying to say to us through these scriptures, Father. We give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, this lesson, it's uh, and again, it's in the book of Galatians, and I know we've been several week, uh, weeks in the book of Galatians, but uh, it's, some, it's some really good instructions, and the Apostle Paul had some great things to say. But this instructions for Christian living, it says Christians are called to live for God and to demonstrate his goodness. In other words, we are to be walking like Christ. People should see Christ in us. Uh, there's a scripture that says, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that should show forth the praises of him who has called you, we're called, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So number one, we're chosen. We need to remember that. Number two, we are called by God to be the light for the world. He said, when I'm here, I'm the light. When I go away, you'll be the light of the world. So that's why we have instructions that God has given us in his word on Christian living so others can see Christ in us. Uh, the lesson overview says, Often Christians are told to focus on their own shortcomings and not the sins of others. However, as Apostle Paul taught the Galatians, Christians must not only be ready to repent of their own sins, but also be ready to help restore fellow believers who are guilty of serious moral failure. You know, uh, at times it seems like uh, throughout my Christian walk and things I've seen over the past 10, 15 years, uh, a lot of uh, groups, uh, different groups of people and even uh, sinners, people who don't even know God, they're quick to forgive one another in their own circles. But sometimes Christians, we're, we, don't, we, we don't help our wounded. We don't reach out to them. 
we have a tendency to just leave them out. But the Bible says we're to restore them. And we'll go back to the same scripture I'm fixing to use right now in a little bit when we go to reading in Galatians 6. But Galatians 6 and 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Now, now look back, it says, you who are spiritual. A lot of times you've got people uh, that are trying to correct other people uh, in, in churches and things, and they themselves uh, are not living and walking a good spiritual life. They're not really rooted and grounded in the Lord the way they should be. And when you take somebody who's not sold out to God and they try to correct somebody else, they have a, a, a tendency not to do it in the best spirit or the best way because the blind cannot lead the blind. We need to make sure that we're connected to the Lord because we don't want to wound people we want to win them back. We want to see them restored. And our God is a God of restoration. So we should be ready to help restore fellow believers who are guilty of these serious moral failures. This kind of help Christians offer one another is more than a mere procedure to be followed. It is a priority to help carry one another's burdens of weakness by means of forgiveness. And the scripture does tell us to forgive others. Uh, it says, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. You know, it, it's easy to tell somebody else, you should forgive whoever has hurt you. But when it comes to our front doorstep, a lot of times we don't, we have a problem. We don't want to forgive others who have wounded or hurt us. But our contingent, the, the scripture, the way that it reads, it said, forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So it sounds like God's forgiveness to us, as, as he extends it to us, he expects us to extend our forgiveness to others. And if we don't forgive uh, people of the things they've done to us, the scripture says, neither will your father in heaven forgive you of your trespasses. So we want to be very careful to stay in the right spirit to try to bring restoration and, and show love to people who are hurt or wounded and, and not be uh, so judgmental. But it says Christians should also show their love for one another by practical acts of service and they seek to attract, uh, as they seek to attract the unsaved to come to Christ by doing these good works to them. In other words, our main goal should be living a life in front of people where they see the love of Christ in us and it draws people. It attracts people to Christ. They say, I see something in that person. I see a peace that the world does not have and it attracts them to the God that we're serving. That should be our ultimate goal is to win the lost and to restore people in right standing with God. The lesson outline, uh, the it's got three different parts. In the first part, there's an A and a B to it. The first part, A is to restore and B is to examine. Now, I looked up this definition, uh, what it means to restore. It means to bring back a return to a former position. And, you know, a lot of times we see people that get weak uh, on their Christian walk. They begin to fail. And, uh, you know, if we would just uh, in love, go to them and say, look, we love you. We're praying for you. And we want you to know that God loves you. A lot of times we can, through love, we can draw them right back into right standing with God. So we want to see people restored. And it says, while we're doing this, examine our own works. The, the Bible tells us as a man uh, looks in a mirror or as he looks at his own reflection in the water, this should be the way that we examine ourselves. You know, uh, a lot of people don't like looking in mirrors. They say, uh, you know, I don't, I don't see what I like. Well, a mirror, it, it, all it does is reflect what is there. So as we look into the mirror, if we see things we don't like, we can change those things spiritually. We can work on those things. So we need to make sure we're in right standing. And uh, the second part uh, of the lesson outline says to preserve in doing good and it's the concept, A, of sowing and reaping, and B, of doing good to everyone. Uh, you know, the church today, uh, a lot of people, and, and I, don't, I don't mean to be judgmental when I say this, but a lot of people today, 
they see the church uh, as a as a welfare system. It's some way, and you've got people that will travel around and go from church to church to church. They're trying to get a light bill, a water bill, a gas bill, a phone bill paid or whatever. And, and you know, he, here's the thing about it. If they're not attending the house of the Lord and they're not partaking of the spiritual things, how can you reap where you have not sowed? And, and that's that goes for the Christian as well. How can we expect God to give us a harvest in places we've not sown? We've got to reach out and love people, but at the same time, we've got to tell them it's not just in a cookout. It's not just uh, in, in a, a church play or, or in a drama that you may watch. But we want you we want you to understand that we're here to worship the Lord. We want to love you and encourage you. That's how we're going to draw people. So we need to sow into the lives of others spiritually, and that will draw them to Christ. And it says to do good to everyone. And the scripture tells us to do unto others. And, you know, I heard a guy one time, he said, I know that scripture. Do it to others before they do it to you. And that's the world's mentality. They believe that they will uh, get one up over somebody before they have a chance to get them. But God says in his word, he says, do unto others as you would have them to do unto you. So we always want to treat others with kindness and do, uh, do them exactly the way we would want someone to do us. And the third part of the lesson outline is to glory in the cross. Uh, in other words, it's, it talks about the hypocrisy of false teachers, number one. And number two, it talks about only boasting in the things that have been accomplished through the cross. The definition of hypocrisy is to claim to have a moral standard which your behavior does not conform to. And don't we see a lot of that in the day we're living in? A lot of people, the word says, in the end of time, there'll be a lot of people with their lips, they'll do me service, but their heart is far from me. So we never want to be hypocrites. We always want to be living up to the standards of God. And we're not going to be perfect, but we can always seek his righteousness. All these other things will be added to us if we'll seek his righteousness. So we don't want to be hypocrites. And to boast only in the things of the cross. The scripture says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And, and I see people a lot of times on their Christian walk after they've been serving God 10, 15, 20, 30 years, they begin to think that somehow it's in their action or their service to the Lord. We need to remember when we first got saved when other people come to the Lord, we need to remember it takes them time to mature, that they are babes in Christ. We don't need to be judgmental of them. We need to work with them. And if we keep working with them, in time, they're going to bear fruit. And in time, they're going to mature. And we, we need to remember, without God in our lives, we can do nothing apart from him. The golden text, Galatians 6 and 9 says, Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint, if, if we do not faint. In other words, we can't give up. We've got to realize that uh, all the good things that we do, they come from the Lord, and all the things we do in his kingdom, it comes from his strength as he empowers us by the Holy Ghost that works in our lives. Uh, Acts 17 and 28 says, For it's in him that we live and move and have our being. So God, he gives us strength for service every day. When we wake up, his mercies are new every morning. The teaching goals in this lesson are to impart and reinforce knowledge. It's a Christian's responsibility to live for God, to reject sin, and, do, and to do the good uh, Christian values in front of all people that we are around. In other words, we shun the very appearance of evil. We don't want, we don't want people, we don't want our good to be evil spoken of. Well, if somebody sees you, you've been witnessing, you've been talking about the Lord, and all of a sudden, maybe they see you in a place you don't need to be, or you're watching something on TV you shouldn't be watching. It ruins, uh, it ruins that witness that you have. So we want to be careful that we impart knowledge to them and, and, and that we will be an encouragement to them. And the second part is to influence attitudes. Uh, we should be, as Christians, 
we should be forgiving and we should encourage other Christians to also be forgiving uh, and, and to encourage them not to sin and to repent and to abstain from being proud and having hypocritical attitudes in relation to all people. Uh, have you ever seen people that they were so judgmental of others, but maybe when it was their children or their grandchildren, if they were doing the same thing, they wouldn't judge them quite as harshly. And the Bible warns us about pride. It said, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit goes before a fall. Uh, the third part of the teaching goes is to influence behavior. Uh, the behavior to what? To help restore Christians who have fallen into, into sin and to encourage them to repent, to be an encourager of fellow Christians to do good to everyone around them. In other words, the scripture talks about he who wins souls is wise. And another scripture says uh, that love covers a multitude of if we love them and we tell them, okay, I don't approve of the sin in your life, but I want you to know that God loves you, I love you, and I'm praying for you, that's going to help them. It's going to encourage them. It'll influence their behavior as they watch the way that we act. Uh, the historical literary background about this lesson, it says, it is known to readers of the Apostle Paul's letters in the New Testament that he usually would dictate his letters uh, to his ministry associates who wrote for him. A perfect example of this is where uh, uh, Tertius, he says, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, greet you in the name of the Lord. That's, that's Romans 16 and 22. Uh, now, Paul's letter to the Galatians that we see here may be the only one that he wrote in his own hand. He says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. And earlier, Paul mentioned to the Galatians, uh, he said, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Uh, he said, because, and because of these statements, many people believe that Paul may have suffered from an eye condition uh, called trachoma. And, and we know that the scripture said Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and if you would, uh, over the years, the many things I've heard people guess that maybe were the downfall or weakness of Paul, but I, I, I have a tendency to think that maybe this was it because he, he usually would not write his own letters. His eyesight was so bad when he would write, the letters were just huge. So uh, I, I think it might have been something to do with his eyesight. But in Galatians 6 and 1, going back to that, where Paul begins to write this letter to the Galatians to encourage them. He says, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, that means to be caught off guard. Have you ever seen people that in their Christian walk, especially when they first start out for the Lord, maybe they have weak moments and they fail, uh, they disappoint the Lord, and we should encourage them when they're overtaken in these trespasses. We shouldn't judge them harshly. We should encourage and come alongside them and try to get them uh, to get up in their spiritual walk and keep going. He says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. In other words, as we are led by the power of the Holy Spirit uh, with a spirit of love and gentleness, we are to restore them. And then it says, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Uh, in other words, love them, go after them, but don't get so close that you fall to the very trap and temptation that they've fallen in. And it says, bear one, one another's burden. This is verse two. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Uh, just, just to say it simple, love one another. Uh, have a burden for people around you that are hurting, other Christians that are hurting. Maybe they have uh, uh, some sort of illness in their life or some weakness, some fleshly weakness, you know, and they're not in their walk with God like they need to be. We need to love them and pray for them. So we need to bear one another's burdens uh, and we'll fulfill the law of Christ in this. Verse 3 says, For if anyone thinks himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Now, as I was praying, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, um, we know that we're heirs and joint heirs. We, we preach this and how uh, we are royalty. We are righteous. Your righteousness becomes our righteousness. And, 
And I said, well, you know, what, what is this? And, and the Lord just uh, began to, to, to speak to my mind. He said, you know that scripture that says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. That's another translation of this. Um, in other words, we don't want to be arrogant. We don't want to be cocky. We don't want to come off that way to other people uh, that encounter us in our Christian walk because that, that wouldn't be very becoming of a child of God. Um, and, and if we go further here, it says in verse 4, let each one of us examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. The Scripture does tell us take up our cross and follow him. Life's not always going to be easy just because you're a child of God. And we all have problems, that's for sure, but we need to just realize we've got problems and make sure Christ is our answer to our problems. Every time we need to pray and ask God, put it in his hands. It says, let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Now, you know what Paul was saying here? It's not just that they were supporting a minister in Paul. It was a fact that Paul was doing the work of the Lord, and when they supported him, they were supporting God's work. So Paul was saying, the Lord will honor you as you honor me. And, and we see how the people took care of him. And God does that, not just for ministers, but he does that for the entire body. He meets our needs. He's our healer. He's our provider. He's our joy. He's our strength. He's everything. Uh, but let's go, go just a little bit further here. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. And the Lord knows if you are sowing to the flesh or if you are sowing to the spirit. And, and it's evident in a, a, a person's uh, spiritual walk. If you watch them and they're struggling with a lot of fleshly things, They've been investing in sowing more of their time into the fleshly world, but if they're more of a spiritual nature, they're sowing to those spiritual things. And it's going to show up because you, you cannot reap where you have not sown. So we want to sow and invest in God's work and in His kingdom, and we want to sow to the things of the Spirit. And, and this very verse says that, For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Well, so what are we reaping by the Spirit, Brother Little? You're reaping eternal life. Your reward is heaven. And we know that if you are not reaping to the Spirit, you're reaping to the flesh and you're living sinful ways. If you don't get saved and repent before you die, we know what you're going to harvest from that also. So we just we, we want to make sure we're following the Lord. It said, and let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. In other words, don't give up. And the Apostle Paul did that. He said, I fought a good fight. Some days on your Christian walk, it's going to be easy and the sun's going to be shining, but there's going to be days in your Christian walk where it is a literal, like Paul said, it's going to be a fight. It's going to be a struggle. And we want to make sure that we fight that fight. We don't give up and we don't lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. In other words, we're to do good to everyone, but especially our fellow Christians, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, because we're all serving one God. And we're all working in his field. So we want to be there and help one another and be in unity together. We want to help each other. It says, see with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. Again, you can tell this is Paul's having a struggle with his eyesight. It says, as many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, they're still trying to live by the law, but they want you to follow their ways so they can tell people, look, they're following me. I'm doing right, and they're following me. And see, we don't want to do that. We want to live in front of them, and we don't boast in ourselves as children of God. We boast in Christ. Paul said, all I want to know is Christ and Him crucified. And when we're in our churches, that's what we need to tell people. 
Anything good you see, it comes from Jesus Christ. Any good spirit that you feel here, it comes from Jesus Christ because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus paid the bill. He accomplished it all. Amen. But let's, let's go further. It says, for not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. In other words, they can tell people, well, they're following me. It says, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of Christ. In other words, Paul said, I want people to know when they see me and they say, oh, look at the miraculous change in Paul. He said, I want people to know I didn't do this myself. He said, I was never crucified for you. Don't put me on a pedestal. He said, it's in Jesus Christ and it's in him alone. And that's what we need to point to, the cross and what Jesus accomplished. It says, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. If you'll remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus, this is the change we're talking about. You must be born again. There's got to be a heart change, a mind change. We've got to become a new creature in Christ Jesus, a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Now, what does that mean? The way that's worded, if you read that, it's kind of peculiar. But what it's talking about, is talking about the Jews who have actually accepted the fact that Jesus is the Messiah, and he's placed a blessing on them for recognizing that and coming out from under the law uh, and believing in grace and mercy and what Jesus accomplished on the cross. It says, from now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. If anybody could ever tell somebody loved Jesus, it was Paul, because Paul was beaten so many times, no doubt he had many scars on his back and his legs where he had been whipped. And he said a lot of times they would give him uh, 40 lashes minus one. In other words, 39 lashes with a whip. So his back, he probably had a lot of scars. And, and, and you know, it said that we should uh, join in the fact when we're persecuted for the sake of the gospel. And Paul certainly was. And, and you know, a lot of things... If people make fun of us today or they don't like the fact that we're Christian, we think that we're persecuted. We have never suffered the type of persecution that the Apostle Paul suffered. We've never uh, had our relatives burned alive or to be ushered into an arena and, and lines would eat them alive. We've never suffered that type of persecution. And I thank God, Father, it may come a day because we've certainly got a group of people today who hate Christians and they hate the church, but what they don't realize, the only thing that's holding judgment back on this earth, the only thing that's stopping chaos on this planet is the power of the Holy Spirit that is still striving with God's people on the earth. And after the rapture takes place and we leave here, the Holy Spirit's going to go back with us and the earth is going into a state of chaos they're going to they're going to look back and they're going to wish for the days when God's people would still be here but we're going to be long gone and we're going to be in heaven with God and and I'm looking forward to that day it says brethren the grace of our lord jesus christ be with your spirit amen now you know grace is when you look up the definition to it it's unmerited favor i thank god that when i didn't deserve it he reached down. He loved me while I was still yet a sinner. He loved me enough that he reached down and in grace and mercy, he picked me up and he planted my feet on a rock. And he, he loved me when I didn't even love him. And, and that's why we love him so much because he first loved us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So that's the reason we live the life that we live that's the reason we try to influence others. We want them to know this same Jesus that we know. Uh, in some of the early churches, as do some of our churches today, uh, people like to contend that because they are saved by grace, all that matters is that they believe in Christ and how they live, whether good or bad, does not matter. 
Uh, can I tell you, this is straight up one of the biggest tricks of the enemy. Have y'all ever been to a, a funeral? You know somebody, they, they drank a fifth of liquor every day, they smoked weed, they cursed every other breath, they were mean to everybody they, uh, that they come in contact with, but because they had walked an aisle and shook a preacher's hand when they were 12 or 14 years old, they say, oh, they're saved. Th that's a lie. That That's something right out of the pits of hell. We've got to love people, and we have got to follow God as closely as we can. It says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Heaven forbid, certainly not. So we, we don't want to fall into that trap. Uh, this makes a mockery of grace because we are saved by grace. Uh, and the reason that God saves us by grace is so we will cease from sinful living and dedicate ourselves wholly uh, to living and relying on the grace of Christ the Word of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to pray every day that He would lead, guide, and direct us. The Bible says the steps of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Uh, and it says, discussing the lesson, restoring those who sin. And it talks about when it becomes apparent that a fellow Christian is overtaken in a thought, a transgression, or a sin, action must be taken by Christians who are spiritually strong enough to restore the sinner. This has to be done in a spirit of meekness, with gentleness, and with humble recognition that all Christians can be tempted and that we could fall at any time. Uh, while all believers in Christ stand justified before God and are one in Christ, they are at different stages of spiritual strength and spiritual vulnerability. In other words, maturity for a child of God, it comes as we, uh, the longer we serve him, the more we study his word, the more we're in prayer with him, the more miracles that God has performed in our life, the more that it builds our faith. We're, we're mature and we can help those around us maybe that have not seen the miracles uh, of God as strongly in their life. We can encourage them. We can witness to them about the things that God has done for us and encourage them. Uh, it says, why are spiritually mature, discerning, and experienced Christians recommended to do the ministry of restoration for Christians who are guilty of serious moral failure? I can tell you why. Uh, because they have been there. They have bought the T-shirt on it. We've all failed before, spiritually speaking, fallen and busted our nose and landed in a spiritual mud hole. But the Bible says that a righteous man may fall seven times. But you know what we do? We get up and we continue that Christian walk. And we can tell them how we overcame by our testimony and the blood of the Lamb. And that encourages them to pray and repent. And we do those things in love. That's how we encourage them. Uh, the Apostle Paul warned against having an arrogant attitude of moral superiority to Christians in need of restoration. A too high opinion of one's own self is deception and it's extremely unbecoming for a child of God. This is a bad mindset and, and people that think this way will not have compassion and love towards others, much less show the gentleness that's required to successfully restore a fallen fellow Christian. The fact is, no Christian is immune to temptation. How many of you have been tempted this week? I have. That's not sin. That means the devil is alive and well. He's on his job. It would be a poor enemy that didn't tempt a Christian every day of his life. You know how we overcome those things? Through prayer through study of the word, through fellowship with other uh, people who are like-minded. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. If you're down, if you're having a bad day, call somebody and ask them to pray for you. Somebody that you know is spiritually mature, that they're studied in God's word and they're following him. That will encourage you. Uh, let's go further here. It says, one of our moral responsibilities as a Christian is to give our spiritual, moral, and material support to those who preach and teach the gospel. We receive and benefit from their ministry, and it is only right that they should have our support 
providing for their needs so that they can do this ministry without hindrance. No one else can do our giving for us. God's word says, give and it shall be given. Pressed down, shaken together, running over. That's how God gives to us. So we want to give into his work and his kingdom that way. It says, whether that giving be spiritual, moral, or material in nature. And a perfect example of this to me is missionaries that go out on the mission field. They're not able to support their own self, but as Christians, we support what they're doing because they're going out to other countries. They're reaching the lost and they're spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. So when we sow into their ministry, we are supporting the work of the Lord. And that's why we do that. Uh, it says, why would thoughts about restoring fallen Christians lead logically to thoughts about the need we have as Christians for honest self-examination uh, of our own works? When the scripture said that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, I'm so glad that when I needed mercy, God did not give me judgment. We, we all have fallen short at one time or another in our life. Some of us more than others, and that's on me, I'll say that. But you know what? When, when I was faithless, God was always faithful to me, and, and I thank him for that. It says, while no Christian is perfect, in the ordinary sense of the word, the number of Christian uh, people today and credential Christian ministers who engage in acts of serious moral failure compromise, uh, or, or it comprises a very small percentage of the total uh, amount of people in our churches. In other words, you're always going to have people uh, in, people say, well, there's a lot of sinners in the church. You know why? Because there's people in the church. The church is made up of people and people are imperfect. But what we don't want to do, uh, back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you would hear somebody, they would go sit down in love and they would put their arm around somebody and say, brother, you are, you became a member of this church because you're a member of the body of Christ. And you're, you're telling everybody that you're a child of God, but you're falling short here. You're, you're, you're smoking or drinking or cursing or uh, you're in some kind of a, a, a sinful sexual relationship. And, and they would tell them in love and say, you need to repent. Why? Because an elder in the church would tell you, uh, you are bringing a reproach against the church and against the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're claiming to be a child of God and other people who don't know any better, they see you doing all these horrible things. They say, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian to them because I'm doing those same things. And we bring a reproach on him. And we don't want to do that. The Bible says we crucify him afresh when we do those sins willfully like that. And we don't want to do that. So we, we always need to make sure that we're following the Lord very closely. It says, preserve in doing good. Presuming that oneself cannot fall into sin is a common way people deceive themselves. It is also self-deceptive to think that sin will have no consequences. And you live in a world where people believe that today. They say, I confess that, that I believe in Jesus Christ, so that means I'm saved and I'm going to heaven. The Bible said even the demons believe and tremble but they're not saved just because they believe in Jesus Christ, that they know he's the son of God. You say, well, I don't hear demons confessing that. Oh, but in the scripture, didn't we? When Jesus, when he went to cast the devil, uh, all those demons out of legion, do you know what they said? What do we have to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? They know exactly, the demons know exactly who Jesus is. And they said, have you come to torment us before our time and to cast us into the abyss? In other words, not only do we know who you are, Jesus, that you're the son of God, we also know that you have the authority over us, that you could speak the word and we would be cast back into the pits of hell right now. So if the demons know that, and they're not saved, and they know who Jesus is. Just because we speak his name, the Bible says where there'll be a people in the end of time with their lips, they will do him service, but their heart is far from him. It's a heart condition. It's not what you say out of your mouth. It's the way you live your life. Are you walking in faith? Are you walking in the attributes of Christ? 
uh, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report. Are we walking this way before the Lord? That's what he expects out of us. It says, the fact is, God sees sin, and he judges those who refuse to repent of their sins. Paul warned that refusal to believe that sin has consequences is a mockery of God, whether it be in nature or spiritual. Whatever we sow or plant, that is what we will also reap or harvest. The principle of sowing and reaping is in effect for those who do evil as well as those who do good. And uh, there were some questions right here at the bottom of this lesson. It says, regarding the consequences of sin, why is the principle of sowing and reaping very bad news for people who refuse to repent of their sins? Because hell will be their reward if they refuse to repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ and become a new creation, a new creature in Christ Jesus. So the sins, that's what they're doing. They're sowing seeds of corruption, and they're going to reap corruption in the end of time from that. But also it says regarding the rewards of right living, why is the principle of sowing and reaping very good news for people who have repented and are living for Jesus Christ? Because heaven will be our reward. We're sowing good seed, and we're, uh, and we're sowing in righteousness. And the Bible says in the end of time, it talks about heaven and how glorious it'll be. It says, I hath not seen nor ear heard, nor hath it entered the heart of a man, the glorious things that await those that serve the Lord. So serving God is a lot, a lot like working in a garden and sowing seeds. We want to sow good seeds so we can have a good harvest. But I want to read uh, the response to the word. It said, Christians today might be tempted to boast in a number of things. All the same things that tempt the worldly-minded people. However, as Christians, it is our moral responsibility to reject temptation and do what is right. The Apostle Paul, doing this, said he would boast of nothing except the cross of Christ. Why? Because all that we are and all that we have as believers in Christ, we owe to Christ, who died for our sins and saves us from our sins. Our testimony must be the same of Paul. By the grace of God, I am what I am. How many of you feel that way tonight? By the grace of God, I am what I am. I know exactly where I came from. I know where I was headed to if I didn't repent and God had not saved me. And that's why I love him. If you'll remember, there was a story in the Bible. Jesus said there were two men, one owed 500 denarii and one owed 50. And he said that when they could, neither one of them could repay. He was telling this to Simon. He said, neither one of them could repay. And the master quickly forgave them both. And he said, Simon, which one of these do you suppose loved the master more? And he said, the one that he forgave the most. And Jesus said, you have spoken rightly. Tonight, I testify to that. I feel like that. I love him because he forgave me for more. He's a good God. He's a merciful God. And we need to remember, we never boast in the way that we live. We always say it's through Christ and him crucified. I only glory in the cross and what he accomplished. When he bowed his head and said, it is finished, that's because he paid the bill and he did a perfect job of it. He was that perfect sacrifice. And if we will walk in the light, according to our knowledge and ability, as the Holy Spirit leads, guides, and directs us, we will have these Christian values that this lesson is talking about tonight. Let's bow our head and go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your word, God. I pray right now, Lord, that you would touch our people tonight. Those that are sick in body, we pray that you would touch them, God. Those that need a miracle, God, whether it's spiritually, physically, or financially, we know, God, that your arm is not short concerning your people. Continue to bless our church, our community, and God, we pray for revival. If our country ever needed revival, 
It's the day that we're living in today. And the way that revival is going to come, people are going to see you in the life that we live. Help us to walk in your commandments and to love you. And other people will see your light in us, Lord. And I pray it and believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed, church.